Now, let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and look at these qualities and characteristics of what deacons are like. He says in verse 8 of 1 Timothy chapter 3, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, and not addicted to wine, and not greedy for dishonest gain that there was a respectability about them, that there was a, a seriousness about them. And, and when I say seriousness, I'm not saying that they never smiled or that they never told a joke, but that you would say that is a person of substance. You know, I, I meet people all of the time, and I can tell in the first few seconds of conversation whether this is going to be a conversation that is going to go deep or whether it's going to be a conversation that goes just like this. I went, I went to seminary in Texas, and I really enjoyed my time in seminary, but the different states in the United States have very different cultures and very different people, and maybe the different regions are the same way here. Uh, but the description of Texas people that I heard and I found to be true in some way, and I mean no disrespect by this, is that they're an inch deep and a mile wide. What that means is they only talk about surface things. Oh, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? Oh, you have a great day. And, and we all do that from time to time. But, but when I come home and I sit down with a group of people over a cup of coffee or, or a supper and we sit down and we say, so what is God doing? There's only a certain group of people that you can say, I want to go deep with you. I want to talk with you. These deacons should be people who are dignified, who have a richness to them, who are not double-tongued, which means that they don't tell you one thing one day and tell you another thing another day. They're not addicted to much wine. Again, this is about the gospel. This is about the reputation. And if they're an alcoholic or if they're struggling with an addiction to wine, what good are they going to do to the gospel work of God in that church? It says, not greedy for dishonest gain. The elder's description was not a lover of money. Here the description is not greedy for dishonest gain because these are going to be the servants in the church and if they're looking for opportunities to say, I think I could get ahead at the expense of that person, they're not going to make a very good deacon at all. He says, I want them in verse 9 to say, they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And I said, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by the mystery of the faith? When the Bible talks about a mystery, what it's saying is that it is something that God has not previously revealed in time past, but is now revealing to us. And that when we look at the doctrinal teaching of the Word of God and the revelation of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. He says, I want you to hold all this mystery of who God is and His teaching that He has given to the world. He says, I want you to hold that with a clear conscience. I want you to hold that in such a way that you say, God, I, I am not perfect, but you are purifying me, and what I am learning about you, it is changing me, it is transforming you. You say, well, why is that so important? Do you remember what the problem in their churches were? False teachers were coming in. Men were coming in and teaching doctrines that were not the true gospel. They were twisting it. They were changing it a little bit, and the people were getting confused, and their worship services were getting kind of riled up, and there was chaos ensuing in the churches. And he said, you know what? In order to restore the order, I need deacons who serve who have an understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the glorious mystery of the deep truths of what God is sharing with the world. That's the kind of leaders that I need. And notice he isn't telling us yet at all what these men do and th what these women do. He says, this is the kind of person I'm looking for. I remember several years ago, um, I had been at Bethel for a number of years and I was really wondering, is God done with me here? I, I always wondered when I came into um, pastoral ministry, how would I know when the time was to move on to another church? Maybe I'll spend all of my career at Bethel. And I said, that would be great. But my spirit was churning a bit, and a pastor friend of mine that I had known for a number of years had decided to leave his church, and God had called him to a different ministry. And he gave me a call one day, and he said, Bruce, would you consider being the pastor of the church in which I've been serving for these last 20 years? And I said, Pastor, um, your church is much larger than our church. What makes you think 
that I could even potentially pastor your church or try to fill your shoes. He said, Bruce, I know you don't have experience in a larger church, but he says, I've watched your character, I've watched your integrity all these years, and I, know, I don't know your skills for a church that size, but I think you have the character to do this. And I've never forgotten that. I'm not sure if there could be a greater compliment paid to a person than that. Now, God directed in different ways. We did not leave Bethel. God reaffirmed His call on us there. That was great. But the point was, character was more important at that particular time than particular skill. And even in these deacons who have service-oriented ministry, Paul is saying to them, listen, I am interested in your character. I'm interested in your integrity. Look at verse 10, and let them also be tested first. Let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Remember Corey? I told you that he was an usher. A great place for him after demonstrating that he was an usher would have been to make him a deacon because he loved to serve people. He was always aware of what was going on in people's lives. He had this tremendous heart because of what God had done in him. There was a period of testing and people were watching him and observing him and seeing his character. I love that qualification. I think that sometimes our churches, we have so many needs in our churches. They say, oh, if we only had this person or if we had this position or if we had this, then our church could be great. And so a new person comes to our church and they say, oh, they seem like a really great person. Would you like to be this particular leader? And we rush them into spots that they're not ready for. So Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, when you look for these deacons, I want you to be able to test them. I want you to prove their character. Verse 11, here it says, Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Now some Bibles say deaconesses. The word literally there is for woman or wife. I'm not saying that the expression deaconess is wrong, not at all. I have no problem with the, the notion of having deacons and deaconesses in the church. But literally the word is woman or wife. And that it's possible that maybe there are two, two ways in which the men and women can serve. Or maybe the deacon and his wife become a servant team. Either case, and I'm going to let you wrestle with that in your churches as to which way. Uh, we have had deaconesses and what we now call women's ministry. But sometimes I wonder if those ministries could simply be blended together with what the deacons are doing because they're both service-oriented things. Again, I'm going to let you wrestle with that because in the end, the gospel of Jesus Christ is served. But look at even whether they're wives or whether it's a position of deaconess, their character and their, their integrity is also very important. He says they need to be dignified and respectable, just like we talked about with the men, not slanderers not using their tongues to run people down, to talk about people behind their back. He says, I want them to be sober-minded. I want them to be clear thinking. I want them to understand what this is all about. I want them to be faithful. I think of some women in our church who are just incredibly faithful. They just serve and they just serve. And I say, don't you ever get tired of serving? But there's a small group of women that, that, that they just understand how God made them and where their place of service is and they just serve and they just keep going and keep going and they just seem to love what they do all of the time. And I think that's just phenomenal. So he says, these are the kind of women that I'm looking for who can be servants or serve alongside their husbands in the church. Then in verse 12, he returns to the deacon, the men themselves. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife. So we had that discussion. Again, Put it underneath the umbrella of the gospel. Whatever your marital situation, it should not be a distraction to the gospel. Don't put a person in leadership as an elder or as a deacon if there is some situation in their marriage that would hinder the work of the gospel. But we've covered that, so let's go on to the next one. Managing their children and their own households well. We talked about that as well with the elders. If they can't manage their households well, how are they going to be able to serve well in the church and manage the church? Look at verse 13. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves 
and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I love that. If you are a deacon in a church and God has called you to that place, He said it's going to be good for you and it's going to be good for your faith in Jesus Christ. That when people look at your life and they see your integrity and they see your character and, their love, and your love for the gospel by serving in very tangible ways, whether in this case helping the widows in that particular church in Acts chapter 6, or whether being hospitable and keeping people in your home or fixing things in your church, he said, I want you to serve in such a way that when people look at your life, they say, boy, that is an attraction to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they're willing to do the smaller tasks. They're not the, the preachers and teachers who get all the attention. And in my church, I get most of the attention because every Sunday morning I'm preaching. But we have some men and we have some women who serve behind the scenes that I don't think I pay enough attention to them or draw enough attention to them. They have hearts of gold and they love to serve. And he says it gives you a great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Serving gives us confidence in our faith in Jesus Christ. I go, wow. I think of a couple of guys on our deacons team right now. Uh, the, the leader of our deacons team, we're very sad because he's moving away to a different town. For, for years, we've tried to find the right person to serve as the head deacon. And, and finding the right guy is so important because getting guys together in their conversation, getting tasks done, you need just the right. We found the right person. And unfortunately, he's leaving. But I love this guy because he has a great sense of humor. And when these guys meet together for their team meetings, and, and we're in a meeting next, maybe we're in the elders meeting next door and they're meeting in another room, you hear laughter in the room and the conversation they have, and they come out of the room and they're patting each other on the back. They just love being together. And I think of this guy and I say, you know what, you have such a great attitude. And a couple of times I have thought to tell him, I said, Kurt, I appreciate you so much that you don't just do something to get it done. You actually seem like you have joy in doing it. And he's very humble and he says, oh, pastor, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Really, it's not that big of a deal. But I said, no, it is that big of a deal. That these guys help take care of our church facilities. They take care of our, the, the, the property and the grounds. And when there's a need in the church and someone has a financial need, they're willing to jump in and say, here's how I can help. And I say, man, it doesn't make me say, I'm going to do that too. I recognize that God has called me to be something different. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. I started this example, or, or this... Um passage of scripture by talking about my children and how different they are and how we encourage them to try a variety of things. I would say the same thing here. You might be saying to me, well, I don't know if I have what it takes to be an elder. I don't know if I have what it takes to be a deacon. I mean, this list, this is pretty tough. I mean, you're asking a lot of me, pastor, if you want me to be a deacon in my church, you know what I would say to you? Try anything and everything. Get involved. Don't sit on the sidelines and wait for someone to come to you and you're going to sit and wait for 10 years and you're going to get a bad attitude and you say, well, nobody ever asked me to do anything. We encourage our people to try something, try anything. Maybe you love children. Maybe you love teaching children. Maybe, maybe you say, I couldn't teach if my life depended upon it, but I see things in the church that I can fix. I see people that have needs. There's this guy in our church who every time he talks about, uh, he, he works with alcoholics in an Alcoholics Anonymous in a 12-step program. And every time he talks about these people, tears come into his eyes. And I say, you have such love and compassion for people. I think that he's probably done more for the gospel of Jesus Christ than anybody else in our church. But he doesn't teach and he doesn't preach. He just serves. That's what God is calling deacons and deaconesses or their wives to do, to have a godly character, a godly integrity that as they serve, the gospel of Jesus Christ is seen in them. 
So that brings us to the conclusion of the section on deacons. Now I want to give you a little bit of homework if you choose to do it. I've encouraged you along the way to write a couple of short interaction papers with the things that we've talked about. Here's what I'd like you to do. Either the section on elders or this section on deacons, I'd like you to write a two-page paper that interacts with either one of these particular lists of qualifications or character qualities and apply it to your church situation. Maybe you're the pastor, maybe you're just a worker in the church, maybe you're in the youth group. You say, I'd like to just have you write in light of what these verses say and apply it to your church's situation or write it about yourself. Explain on a, in a short two-page paper how this relates to you and what God might be calling you to do in terms of service. And when you're done, I think you'll find your own fresh way of looking at this in a way that you say, I, I never thought about that before. So if you'd like to do that, that would be a great follow-up to this particular lesson on elders and now most recently on deacons. Well, with that in mind, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, Paul has a little section of praise before he continues with some more of his practical exhortation to Timothy. So let's take a short break. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift.